We talk Nigerian phobia and the different perceptions by which Nigerians are looked out, especially outside Nigeria. My guest is the Honorable Mr. Godwin Adama, the Consul General of the Federal Republic of Nigeria in Johannesburg. And we'll be talking about this perception, real or false, as well as what Christians from Nigeria should be doing to change this perception. This is Chimstock Africa. From Cape Town to Cairo and from Mogadishu to Dakar, this is Chim's Talk Africa. And now here's your host, Chim Onyibilanma. Welcome there viewers to this edition of your show. Thank you so much for joining us. And we are so grateful for those of you who have sent in your comments. Please keep sending in the comments, sending the videos by WhatsApp. And uh, let's hear about what you'd like to see on this show or guests you'd like me to interview on this show or issues from your country you'd like us to tackle here. Send us your videos of your comments and you know, send us emails and all the rest and we'll surely try our best to read it up in, this, in, this, in the coming days. Now, today's interview is with His Excellency Mr. Godwin Adama, the, the Consul General of the Federal Republic of Nigeria in South Africa. You don't want to miss it as he tackles this issue of Nigeria phobia. But before we go into that, isn't it lovely when our politicians keep to their promises that they made during the campaign? That's why I love what uh, President Nana Kofo uh, Ado is doing in Ghana. They promised and they delivered last year the free senior high school education at all, uh, at all parts of, uh, of, of uh, Ghana. And this is great because this year alone, 2018, it's expected that 400,000 students will be enrolled into the senior high school in Ghana. I'm excited because thousands of young people who didn't have the opportunity to assess this level of education before are able to do so now because of this uh, keeping to their promise that the government in Ghana has done. And I think ed education is crucial. And I've said this over and over again. It's one key thing to really breaking the cycle of poverty all around Africa as well as improving our economy and you know when I look at education many times people emphasize the building emphasize the resources that are needed there but the one key resource we need when it comes to our educational system is our teachers if we have a qualified quality teacher even with students under a tree of course we don't want our students to be under the tree but I'm just trying to paint a picture here if we have one quality teacher with a with students under a tree, we will have more impact and well-educated uh, uh, students better than if we had whole laboratories with very, very poor teachers. And we need to emphasize celebrating these ones as well as recompensing them and um, affirming them. And it brings me to the issue of we as Christians. Uh, we need to emphasize as church leaders, even as Christians, the strategic role of being a Christian teacher in a public school. I know in many parts of Africa, we are building our Christian schools and uh, separate from the public school. But let's not lose sight of the mission field in the public schools. The fact that we need to encourage our Christian brothers and sisters to, to go into those places as teachers. Teachers have such powerful influence upon the little ones that are with them. And we can use this influence for good as Brothers and sisters go into this space as salt and light. Don't look at the income. Look at the calling. If God has called you to this space, please go there. It's very strategic. Talking about teachers, when I was in high school, there was a man called Mr. Bright. And you know, this guy, he so influenced us in terms of our behavior, in terms of our grade. He was, his, his passion for science affected my passion for science and also raised up my grade. You think of the impact teachers have on children and how much it's such a blessing to have our children get quality education. But it's not always so easy in many countries for us to assess the kind of education our children need. That's why I'm happy once again this week to mention for those of us staying in South Africa, school days. Look at the website on the screen. 
This is for you to join for free, but it gives you an access if you start to use the loyalty card for doing the things you normally do to save towards the bursary, towards your children's education. And it's cost you nothing. Try it out. Now we're going to an interview with uh, His Excellency, Mr. Godwin Adama. You don't want to miss this. Welcome there, viewers, to this segment of your show. Like I said in the beginning in my intro, our guest today is His Excellency, the Consul General of the Federal Republic of Nigeria in South Africa, based in Joburg. It's the Honorable Mr. Godwin A. Adama. Sir, you're welcome to the show. You're welcome. Sir, you're known as... Uh, a peacemaker you you especially in this your new role in south africa i, I was watching the 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 media press uh, uh press interview uh, or rather the media session you had with the mayor of joburg with the anti-immigrant issue that happened sometime last year and the way you were able to bring calm in that issue with all of the things going on in the papers and the way you were able to insist that we need each other uh, I think it's quite astounding, but the truth is that many people all around in most countries find the issue of Nigerians a bit challenging for them. It's like there is a there is a kind of narrative, what I call Nigeriaphobia. Have you noticed this as you've gone around in the different countries, sir? Well, I have noticed that, but at the same time, one thing that also props of that is that. Uh, Nigerians are the, one of the most educated in the world. Okay. They are in very area, if you are in the United States today, when you have the statistics of those who have had a college degree, Nigerians stand out as one of the best mm. currently. And that is the experience that you get in most, in many countries mm. where they are. Mm. Uh, the, in the academia, in the medical fields, engineering and others. For instance, in South Africa here today, mm. and this not many people may know this, but it is clear that in the medical field, you find that Nigerian doctors are one of the most outstanding, mm. and they are all over the mm. place in the mm. provinces mm. and even all the other places. Mm. And they are doing very well. Some have been here mm. for over mm. 20 years, mm. but non, nothing like, nothing has come mm. out of any of them that is negative. Yeah. We've got quite a number of Nigerians mm. in the academia mm. to go to the various mm. universities. Mm. Some are heads of the medical mm. uh, colleges and all that. Mm. These are people that nobody talks about. They but but, but sir, somebody would say, like, I, I, have a, I have a quote here. Of, so this is what this, uh, they asked him, why is it that Nigerians are, the question was, why are Nigerians hated so much? And he said that the problem is that we encountered we, bef because before we met the Nigerian professor, the hardworking Nigerian businessman, and the Nigerian banker, we met the Nigerian scam, scam artist and the drug dealer. What do you say to that? Yes, of course. You know, in every society, you have the good and you have the bad. There are quite some unskilled Nigerians mm. that will get involved in such. You can never get a Nigerian that is educated. Mm. I have told you that mm. Nigerians are yeah. highly educated. It is not by the fact that you see somebody in such negative, it's not enough mm. to criminalize a whole nation. Because crime is not a nationality of any country. It's not, it doesn't bear <laughs> one badge. It doesn't badge. bear badge. <laughs> Every people that, a criminal is a criminal. And it doesn't have a, a nationality. It just has to be taken the way it is. And that's why for me, as much as I would discourage that, because that is not the Nigerian spirit, a country of over 180 million people, get to Nigeria today, you will understand what I'm mm, saying. Mm. That is not a big mm. issue in Nigeria. Mm. You were just talking about the fact that crime doesn't bear nationality and that what you find is that there is crime everywhere. But people would say, oh, there are so many Nigerians who, are, who we hear that are involved in this. Would you say it's because of the population? Because you talked about 180 million people. So even 2% of that or 
or 5% of that would be, if that's the bad egg, would be very massive? No, I don't think uh, it is in that area of percentage. They may not, the truth of it is that um, basically carrying out consular assignments in most of the countries we have been to, and particularly in South Africa, you will see that most, a number of South Africans Anybody they see that is a black man that mm. is not a South African mm. sometimes, especially if he's not even from Southern Africa, mm. is a Nigerian. Okay. And we have come across issues like that. So it might not even be a Nigerian. not even be a Nigerian. Ah, but the fact that uh, it becomes a cloak <laughs> that people can wear. Yes. And that, it, that increases the perception. Yes, because especially when we go to maybe Lindela, the detention camps, mm. you have to go and profile. And in the process, you find out that some that they have tagged as Nigerians are not Nigerians. Okay. They are other Africans from several other countries. Okay. And of course, uh, who may, a few of which may have just, once they are arrested, they say, mm. I'm a Nigerian. Mm. And of course, if people have to live here, we need to properly profile people. Mm. So, so we're going to take a, a break here. And when we come back, I, I, I want to bring some of the objections people have. And I, I want to ask you what the church can be doing about this. Because as much as we talk about professionals going everywhere, the churches, Nigerian pastors are everywhere. And uh, what can they be doing? How can the church be the instrument of salt and light? And I'm talking about the Nigerian churches. So we'll go for a break here, dear viewers. We're talking to His Excellency, the Consul General of the Federal Republic of Nigeria in South Africa, based in Joburg, Honorable Mr. Godwin Adama. We'll take a break and we're back. Thank you. Do you have any opinions or comments on today's subject or any other issues in your country or around Africa? We would love for you to join the conversation. Please send us your comments by WhatsApp video, voice, or text message to the number on your screen or via Facebook, Twitter, or email. We may be able to include your text, audio, or video comment on a future show. Welcome back, dear viewers, to the second segment of our interview with His Excellency Honorable Godwin Adama, who is the Consul General of the Federal Republic of Nigeria based in Joburg. Sir, thank you for being here. Thank you. You know, a big speak to what I was saying before we went on the break. I said that uh, when it comes to the church, the talk about Nigerian pastors outside of Nigeria, and our viewers are from different, those watching us are in different countries of Africa. So it's not just South Africa now, but Nigerians have pastors in Kenya, in Uganda, and how do you view in your, in your interaction with the clergy, uh, the, the, the men of the clock, what, how do you feel our engagement in changing this perspective? Are we helping or are we adding to the problem? Well, um, my experience in quite a number of uh, countries that I've been to is such that uh, the... Niger the, on the spiritual side, mm. we've got Nigerians have reached a certain level mm. in terms of spirituality mm. and in terms of evangelism to mm. other parts mm. of the world, mm. particularly in Africa. Mm. It has been marvelous. Mm. To, it has been something that has changed the social fabric in certain areas mm. because bringing spiritual things to some areas where spirituality is mm. not really uh, as uh, advanced as, as it is that. in Nigeria yeah. today. Yeah. I, I'm sure you understand what yes, I mean. Yes, sir, I do. Because uh, coming from Nigeria, I'm going to some of the countries. Mm. I was in Greece, for instance. Mm. The level of spirituality, mm. maybe the way we look mm. at it, is mm. not exactly mm. the same. Mm. So for, it, for the truth is that many of these, quite a number of these churches and evangelism mm. outreach mm. help to rescue mm souls that are almost uh, gone. gone. I, I do agree with you. I, I have said my own self, I've said that probably we don't have enough statistical research. I do agree that there's a lot of uh, 
message bearers of the gospel going out of Nigeria to different parts of the world. Uh, and, uh, but what would you say, in your estimation, they're doing good. What would you say to uh, the pastors? If you, what do you say to them in terms of dealing with this perception? Because let's face it, yes. the perception is there. It's there. It's there. It's, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not just going into reading all of the things I have here because the perception is real. Uh, somebody here in Zimbabwe is saying the truth is that this is the perception. And I've met, had a case, one or two. But the truth is that there are many, maybe 80, 90 percent, who have not had any bad experience, but the perception has been accepted by them. How much do you think the churches are helping to change this perception? Yes, um, one thing that I would say is that um, the truth is that once you leave your country outside, whether as a diplomat or as a servant of God, you are supposed to be the ambassador of your country. Mm. What you do has either positive or negative impact on the image of your country. Yeah. And uh, I do know also that as much as good, I mean, genuine people are going out, there are also individuals that may not be actually called mm. into ministry and they have to be there. We have seen this in several uh, times, including even South Africans yes, or yes, even other yes, nationalities. Yes. You see, because some have seen going into ministry as a way of making a living. Yeah, that's of true. Of course, we have occasions like that. Mm. Even in the scriptures, you mm. know that uh, mm. there are They're some charlatans yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> who are that. So that we, nobody has been able to stop that. Mm. But I, my message is that whoever gets out of his country, be a Nigerian, you should be your conduct should be exemplary. Mm. You are supposed to be a mirror, mm. so that you do not in any way damage the image of your mm, country because mm. you are there as an ambassador mm, mm, of your country. Mm. So for some who may in any way mm. try to drag the image into mm. disrepute, mm. of course we, it's not encouraging mm. and I want to let mm. everybody know that once you go out, you must be able to follow the faith which has taken you there. And it's not just not encouraging, it, it, it has some tragic effects because I, I was reading of uh, just in April, uh, a man called Clement Mwaogu, uh, a, an innocent businessman in uh, Rustenburg, was mistakenly identified as, a, I think, a drug dealer. And without being able to be taken to court or anything, they had beaten him up, Bad. burnt him up, and he died from the bonds. It was only later it was found that, that this guy is an honest, Yes. businessman so the, the the perception can be so strong that innocent people suffer uh, what do you say sir because you actually was were one of the people that dealt yes. with that case i was there in rustenberg i had been there even a few days before that and that is one of the things that we talk about when you are talking of whether it is uh, xenophobia or <laughs> nigeria phobia whatever mm. you look mm. at it because nobody is in life, nobody is permitted to take life without. If you have seen that somebody has, has committed a, a, a crime. Or if you suspect, or that, you they suspect have, yeah. that somebody has committed a crime, you report him or take him to the police station and you go through the due process of law. And if that is the case, you will find out that such things will not have happened. The perception in this particular case, this is a guy that was staying mm. in his... Uh, mm in his shop, mm. you came in, a crowd was, of course, I think there was demonstration mm. going on. Of mm. course, when you, are, you see people like that, mm. others could stray out mm. to say, where is the drug? Sometimes mm. that is seeing every Nigerian and thinking that mm. a Nigerian is mm. a drug pusher. Mm. This is not so. Mm. If you even take the statistics, you will mm. discover that this is a minority of the people mm. compared to the majority that mm. are here. Mm. I told you about mm. quite a number of Nigerians yeah. that are here, even yeah. in this country. Yeah. For the past 18, 20 years, mm. in the medical field, they mm. have not had any situation against them, mm. nothing. And none of them has actually been attacked this way. 
It's quite unfortunate, but sir, what are you doing? I mean, this is on your table. What are you doing to change this perspective? We are because that is the question people will ask. They say, well, you know, the perspective is real. The, 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 not the perspective, the perception. The perception is real. It's something that people feel. And yeah. they have uh, one or two examples they base this on. What are you, what has been your approach in dealing with this uh, perception that, is, that needs to change? Yeah, we are advocacy. We are carrying out a lot of advocacy, media, and other, uh, also meeting constantly, uh, town hall meetings to be able to advise, especially for those who may not have uh, anything genuine to do, because this yeah. goes out of people who don't have something So you are to do. actually engaging Nigerians engaging on the Nigerians ground? engaging Nigerians on ground, and we're also engaging we are also engaging even authorities yes. and even the local communities yes. too because like you said most of this thing is based on perception perception yeah and then uh, such that you don't just see anybody within your community as if the person is doing what you think somebody else is doing we would like to take questions from the audience or comments uh, honorable godwin adam adama um i have a comment first and foremost uh, regarding the, you being the ambassador for Nigeria and the statement that you made that uh, Nigerians are the most intelligent people and I'm saying that is well found because you are an ambassador for Nigeria so you are to speak very well about Nigerians if I was a, an ambassador for South Africa I would do the same my, comment, my question then is around the issue of uh, the stigma, the perception that when things go wrong, it's the Nigerians. And my submission then is, um, I can't, are we not seeing Nigerians who you alluded to that they've been here for more than 30 years, who are part and parcel of South Africans, so to speak, that they actually join hands with the South African to deal with what is called crime, because crime knows no race, no, no nationality. In, in, in saying so that we, see, we, we, ha we haven't seen Nigerians who then are with South Africans, saying we are out there to fight the crime. And that is my comment to you and my question to say, why are we not seeing that? So <laughs> I think what he's trying to bring out and, uh, is this, is that is there that insistence on accountability of not just well you're one of my own if you do bad uh, i'll talk to you privately but like you do bad i'm going to deal with you and i'm going to bring it out we don't even hide any any person that does that where we we are working there it's not everything that we say here in the open but we do a lot to ensure that we don't encourage it we do not in any way as a government if you even know the way government of Nigeria deals with such issues, it, it will show you how we deal with it. We have a, a National Drug Law Enforcement Agency that deals with the issue of drugs. So drug is not an issue you can find on the street or perhaps, in Nigeria. Perhaps uh, these things are not out there. Yeah. Uh, I think maybe perhaps these things are not out there because uh, in digging through and preparing for this interview and uh, reading through how you dealt with the issues in Joburg last yes. year, or, uh, which culminated in your meeting with the mayor. The mayor. I, I saw there one of those things you said where you're saying we ourselves want to find these people and deport them. Okay. And you were giving examples of, look, if we find this, this is the person we found, he did this, this is what we have done with him. To round up, you mentioned your, your NGO, your foundation. Could, could you give us a website address uh, and tell us a bit about what that does? Yes, uh, the website address is uh, www.covenantseedofabraham.com. Mm. Uh, of course, it's a help ministry, mm. um, taking care of the less privileged in the society, uh, training the youth, empowering them in skills acquisition and other things. Mm. And at the same time, uh, of course, you know, for every vision, there is a location. Mm. The location of this vision is actually in uh, Nigeria, mm. where I come from. Mm. Uh, in fact, last week, we trained about three, 250 people in That's shoe good. making, bag making. Mm. So, I, unfortunately, we're coming to a place where we have to land this. But I want to go back to your work with the Lord. And that is, where do you, 
when I read in the reports, the many times you have to intervene, the engagement you have with the authorities and the, I think of the trauma of having to deal with some of these cases, where do you find your strength from? How do you refresh yourself? How do you refresh your work with the Lord Jesus? What helps you stay strong? It's the spiritual strength mm -hmm. because uh, you know that once you are in the Lord and you, you derive your strength from him, mm -hmm. grace is what makes God to ignore your errors and mm. color your mm. efforts. Mm. And with grace, there is no, no barrier that you cannot, mm. uh, that you, that you cannot surmount. Mm. I've seen that through fellowship with God has made it easy for me to be able to cope with the uh, circumstances of time. Mm. Uh, of course, and of course, the wisdom you need to handle many of those things. Yeah, the wisdom is necessary because that wisdom also comes from uh, the, your relationship with God. Of yeah. course, as I leave, there's mm. six to seven o'clock every morning I have to go for morning prayers. Mm. And that is a constant uh, mm. issue. Set time apart with the set, Lord. I have to set time. I have to divide my time. Mm. Make sure that I, before I get to the office in the morning, I've gone one hour mm. in the presence mm. of God mm. for fellowship mm. and all that. Mm. And that helps a lot. Mm. And that also, like you said, wisdom is profitable to direct. Yes. And it is uh, using what is available to achieve the impossible, doing what is required in order to get what is desired. So with that divine wisdom, a lot of things get sorted out without much effort because we have already stayed in his presence. And then the next step you are going to be taking will be determined by the the, the, the art flow the of what, you, flow receive of what you have received. That, thank you for sharing so openly. Thank you for joining us and uh, uh, safe trip as you go back to your base. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Welcome back there, viewers. That, that was quite informative. The truth is that the perception is there, but this has to start changing. As we learn today, I look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says, and you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and to the uttermost part of the earth. The truth is that we'd like to claim the first part that says you receive power. We all want the power, but that power is also linked to the commission to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. The gospel we have received is not just for our Jerusalem, our city, our country alone. It's for the ends of the earth. God is taking the church of Africa away from where it's just a mission field. You know, many years ago, Africa used to be the mission field of the world. But now, God is raising a mighty army in Africa and sending the church of Africa, Christians from Africa, everywhere. God is taking us to those who have never heard the gospel. Do you know there are still people in this world right now who live in areas where there is nobody sharing the good news with them? They are called the unrich people. They are people who have not had enough or even any opportunity to hear the gospel. And that's the kind of people that God is raising an army for. Maybe you are watching me and you sense that calling you that this might be the people God is calling me to. It might be in Asia, it might be parts of Africa, there's still parts of Africa where the gospel has not really penetrated. And it might be your turn to respond and say, here I am, God send me. Because it is not enough to concentrate on our Jerusalem. He wants us to at the same time, he says, and Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. Every local church should be both in Jerusalem and the uttermost part of the earth. It's a simultaneous. You can't choose one and not the other. God wants us to carry the, the heart for the unreached. If you feel this is a calling or you need help in this area, contact the website on the screen. This is a group of people who focus on helping churches reach the unreached. Thank you so much for joining us this week. I'll see you next week. Remember to let us know what you think about what you are watching. God bless you. Next week on Change Talk Africa, our disability must never cripple our future. Kola Olugo, the crippled at bat and today's CEO of a leading industry, knows all about this. I'm not going to rely on anybody. I'm not going to, be, I'm not going to pity myself. I'm not going to allow my uh, disability to be an hindrance to me in life. Next week, we talk triumph over trouble. Join me. 
This program is made possible by the generous financial support of believers just like you who share our heart to equip the African church to engage the issues facing our continent. Your financial support will help us continue this important work. If you feel led to give to this ministry, please visit our website today.